Hello and welcome to Everybody Podcast. I'm Daria Matza. Today, I welcome to the show Kai Hibbert. She was first cast into the spotlight as a contestant on the third season of The Biggest Loser. Over the past two years, The Biggest Loser has taken overweight Americans from all walks of life who were fed up with fad diets and pills and were ready to lose weight the old-fashioned way through hard work. Kai, your turn. Let's go, Kai. Come on, Kai. Your previous weight. Oh, the biggest loser. I actually have never watched the show, but it just sounds awful from the little I've seen. Okay, Kai, with your 12 pound weight loss, your team's total is now 61 pounds. After winning second place on the show, she immediately realized the negative impacts the show had on her own life and on society at large. And she began to speak out right away, despite her extensive non-disclosure agreement, which could have gotten her sued. We talk about much more than The Biggest Loser. Her passion will surely grab you. A brief warning, we do talk about weight loss and the egregious methods used by The Biggest Loser. Please know this and take care of yourself. Let's get started. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I've never watched The Biggest Loser, which is probably a good thing I'm, I'm gathering. Yes, it is. That's a <laughs> fabulous thing. And because I'm a dum-dum, I had never watched the show, and then I went on it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I know. So tell me a little bit about that story. How did it How did it begin? So forgive me. I genuinely do have ADHD, so sometimes I wander, and I, no I go on tangents. Okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, I had a roommate at the time who was also a fitness competitor, mm-hmm. so you can imagine the... Um, uh, the disordered eating and the body dysmorphia going on in that house. Yeah. Yeah. And I, all through my undergrad, I worked uh, either two or three jobs and I was double majoring. And so I was always busy. And one of the three jobs that I worked was I was an aerobics instructor. Mm-hmm. And at one point I got hired to um, run the aerobics program as well. Anytime any of my um, instructors canceled, I had to go in and teach their class. Mm-hmm. So basically my senior year of college, I was taking 21 credits a semester. I was working the aerobics job, teaching classes like crazy. Plus I was working at a law office. And this was in Alaska, right? Yes, this is when I lived in Alaska. My undergrad was at University of Alaska. And so I've never been what would be called a traditionally thin person. Never. Like my whole life, I I was a big kid. I'm a big person. I like to say I'm built like a brick shit house. And, (laughs) uh, And I always have been. So even as an instructor, as an aerobic instructor, I was... Uh, it was fun. It was funny to me because there were people come into my class and I could see the skepticism all over their face because of rant and fat phobia. And then because I'm a petty, petty, petty human being, I would make the class even harder mm. until I saw that one person suffer. And then I would go back to my <laughs> regular routine. <laughs> That's funny. I just had Kimberly Dark on who's um, an activist and she's a yoga instructor. And she was saying how people will come into her class and be like, oh, this is going to be an easy class, huh? Yes. <laughs> yes, that is the vibe I would get. And I'd be like, oh, you, I see you. Yeah, I'm going to break you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, because I'm petty. Anyway, so I, I've always been in a larger body. But um, my senior year of college, because I was obviously not eating intuitively, and I was running myself ragged and not sleeping well and trying to finish up so that I could go at the time I had plans to attend law school, I would do things like not eat all day long and work my jobs and teach my aerobics classes, get home, eat what was literally convenient, whatever was in my refrigerator, and then pass out on my face. And I repeated that like seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So my weight went up quite a bit from where I usually stabilize. I mean, um, like I said, I was in a large body, but then I was in an even larger body at that point. And my fitness competitor roommate had watched The Biggest Loser. Mm. And so one evening, um, I believe it was the finale night of season two, she called me upstairs to her half of the house we were sharing. And she was like, oh, my gosh, you have to see this show. And okay. So I saw about two minutes of it. And it was a blonde little Susie standing on the scale and like kicking her leg and celebrating. And so my roommate turned to me and she's like, um, they really need a female winner of this show. And, um, you could totally do it because, you know, I've seen, um, how much weight you've gained. Mm. So 
part of me was like, yeah, go fuck yourself. And, um, and then I went back downstairs and then I went out, um, shortly after dancing with a bunch of girlfriends on new year's night. And I was incredibly frustrated, you know, in retrospect, I understand that what I was frustrated with was society and not my body. Like I had no doubts that once I started back into a regular routine and I started law school and paying attention to taking care of myself as opposed to beating the crap on myself in pursuit of the goals that I had, um, especially because I was in my 20s, I was like, look, I'm just going to go back to stabilize to where I was. I'm, I'm, I'm not stressing this. I'm not stressing my body. That night, I, I went out with a bunch of girlfriends on New Year's Eve. And, you know, I was, I was the, the, the large bodied friend who couldn't find anything to wear when they're in all cute clothes. And I was mm. bitter and I was pissed. And instead of being bitter and pissed that the problem is that like, you know, society is telling me that I'm not worthy enough to wear a really cute top. I was pissed off at the size of my body, which is something that has been ingrained in me. Well, it's been ingrained in all of us, obviously, especially mm -hmm. women since childhood. Uh, particularly for me, because like I said, being built like a, a brick shit house or whatever, my mother, um, unfortunately for her, grew up in a household with a father who was very fat phobic. My mother is 4'11". She's very petite. She'd been petite most of her life. However, like when we would go home on family visits to see my grandparents, it never failed that my grandfather would be like, so what are you, what are you weighing now, honey? What <laughs> Like you put a little weight on. And my mother at one point was anorexic. Oh, geez. How old were you when that was going on? I was young. I was, uh, we lived in Hawaii at the time. So I would have been between first and third grade at that point. Mm. And so um, her anorexia was pretty severe. I can, I can remember holidays and one Christmas in particular where um, she was so weak that she was wrapped in blankets in Hawaii on Christmas mm. day. And like, so weak, she was really unable to like lift her head and lift her arms, and we had to carry her presents to her. Oh, uh, yeah, heartbreaking. And, but at the time, you know, I, I didn't process what was going on with my mother, and um, so we moved to New Jersey after that, and my mother gained a substantial amount of weight. Did she go through any sort of program? Did she acknowledge that she had anorexia? Or Not for it, it years. Was... I don't think I actually heard it spoken from her until she watched me speak at the BETA conference in 2015. Oh, wow. Her and okay. I, she, she watched my presentation and she grabbed me afterwards and we had a really long talk. And, and, and it, it's been amazing because she's fully open and she's fully aware that I tell these stories and these anecdotes from my life. And she's, you know, given me permission to do that. But once we made it to New Jersey, she decided because she'd gained weight, she wanted to do Weight Watchers. And I became her Weight Watchers buddy in the fourth grade. Wow. Wow. You know, I, I mean, yeah. So, it's, so it, it's, it's, really it's, it's old for you. It's like oh, the, yeah. the old, the old story in your blood, really. It just started really young being mm -hmm. indoctrinated into diet culture and then yo-yoing from there. And so on that New Year's Eve, you know, I'd been primed for this, this reaction to myself and this reaction to my body. And I sent in a, a videotape the next morning. Well, I mm. made the videotape the next morning and I sent it in and um, honestly kind of dismissed it and forgot about it with my application. And I believe two, three months later, I heard back. And, and what I heard back basically was like, hey, we're sending you a ticket. You're coming to L.A. Wow. Sight unseen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just saw the video and they're like, we're bringing you. And, um, up to that point, as far as I knew, I was the only person ever cast just from a video. Um, most other people were cast from casting calls and repeat visits. And I wonder if that had to do with how amazing you were or Alaska. Um, I had, I, my <laughs> suspicions are nobody wanted to come to Alaska in the dead of winter to do a casting call. I, and, yeah. I mean, I, you, I, I granted your tape was amazing, but I have a feeling that might be part of the No, the I'm equation. pretty sure it was the, it was the Alaska thing. <laughs> um, I also say that I was the only person up to that point cast as just a videotape. And I'm pretty certain that they probably haven't repeated that process mm. given the amount of trouble I gave them in Not retrospect. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. So, so um, I'm, I'm curious if when I have so many questions are coming to mind for you, but I'm curious about when you were, when they would do your teaser for who you were on the show, did they ever say you were an aerobics instructor? Oh, no. no, no, no. That, that, that kind oh. of, that doesn't work in their narrative. 
Oh, the teasers for the show. Okay, so we have the the most ridiculous non-disclosure agreement I've ever seen in my entire yeah, life. That was on my list of questions for you too, because I'm surprised you've been able to be so open about it with your uh, non-disclosure. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, it's not that I've been able to be open about it. It's that I have to do um, and I have to live with what I can sleep with at night. And so they've threatened to sue me repeatedly for like Mm. millions of dollars, which like if they could find millions of dollars that I had, like that would be amazing. Go to it. I mean, what they could get right now is my student loan debt. So feel free. (laughs) (laughs) Take it. It's all yours. Try that. You can have it. Um, but they never actually followed through with anything on it. And I Well, maybe I, now that the show is over with that. I'm hoping because I yeah. wrote a book and I'd really like to get it out there. That'd be great. Oh, your book isn't out yet. Interesting. Okay. No, it's not. I wrote a fictional reimagining of my experience on um, reality weight loss TV. And it's been nothing but I, I had a literary agent at one point in time. And she was fantastic and amazing. And she's like, nobody will touch this because yeah. <laughs> they were so afraid of the NDA. But the show is completely canceled. And beyond it, it being completely canceled, with the NIH study that came out yeah. in 2015. Yeah, I that definitely want to talk supported, about that. Yeah, that completely supported everything I'd been saying for 10 years. Yes. It's going to be a little hard to come after me. Yeah. So it's, as far as my little teaser. Um, and this and about- was just to, just to put some times in people's minds. This is 2006 you were on the show, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I okay. was on the show in 2006. Our finale was in December of 2006. And I came forward about what it was actually like literally in my first interview that I got in 2007. Okay. And um, from that point on, I was... That, that, it was that quick about how obviously like damaging the experience had been. It was actually apparent a lot sooner because my family staged an intervention. Oh, that's right. Okay, wait, we got to back up. Yeah, so, sorry, teaser. I'm all over the place. <laughs> no, yeah. there's just so the <laughs> teaser did not mention that you were an aerobics instructor at all. No, so Do the you... reason I brought up the NDA is like the NDA gave them permission to completely fabricate all of our lives. Oh, interesting. So, so, so who were you? Been like she's a giraffe wrangler from wherever, <laughs> and there would have been like nothing I could do about it. What so, did they? So what did they say you were? My personality was supposed to be that I was basically a party girl and a binge drinker, which is funny because oh, like that's I, funny. I'm not. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> first time I saw my persona per se I'm doing air quotes like you can see me but um was they showed us like um the one of the cookbooks or whatever that they were putting out and you know like Kai's struggle as she gets up from a pool of her own vomit the next day over she likes to get up and make eggs you know I mean like it was oh my god it was just so over the top about how what a what a party girl I was literally later on in the season there is um there's a clip of me hung over and I'm doing air quotes again, where I'm having a discussion with the producer filming the segment where I'm supposed to be talking about how like, I just have to give up my party lifestyle oh, and no. I have to stop drinking. And that's and the were way you I just acting. With- it was four o'clock in the afternoon and I was completely sober and hadn't been drinking the day before. And you were just acting. Yeah. Okay. Like that's what you require. Like, yeah. I don't understand why I don't have a sag or an after. An after yeah. Like, I really, I'm a little bitter about that. I'm but. sure. I could see why. <laughs> Do you feel like in some ways, because you were fit, you were maybe fat and fit that you had an edge on some of the people that were there who were maybe exercising for like, was it unexpected that you could do these exercises without vomiting or <laughs> struggling uh, as much? No, I think it kind of screwed me. I mean, as far as like, quote unquote, winning the competition, only because um, I put on fantastic muscle mass. Mm, Because your body was used to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like when I did, when we went for the finale and they did, um, they do a thing called a DEXA scan where you, it's like you lay on a Xerox machine and they scan your whole body and they see how much is adipose tissue and how much is lean muscle mass or whatever. The doc came in and talked to me and he's like, look, if we were going to base it on factual, like like actual physiological, like positive changes or whatever on who wins this, you won. Mm. Um, And you got, you were in second place, right? Yeah. I came in second place. Um, did you, do you get any money for that? Yes, thank God, because what a lot of people don't realize is, like, it's nearly impossible to actually, like, work a job and be part of this production. Right, because you have to live there for – you have to live at the ranch for three months? I lived at the ranch for almost five months. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, my seasons were my season was a lot longer when they started like seeing more dollar signs. Yeah. They shortened the seasons, which just just blows my mind. Like if you just think about the health ramifications for this, right. they got heavier contestants and shorter seasons, but they expected the same or be- better results. Right. The finale. Oh, it just, like, just, it just like the hurts my heart to think about right these and humans that are just um we were livestock. At- we were livestock. That's what we were to them. I think it's more like you're circus freaks or something. You're on display. Livestock is just like mooing in the field. You're like people's <laughs> people's entertainment, I, you know? I use livestock because um, in my season for one of our challenges, we were literally put on a horse racetrack and put in the stalls and they rang no. the bell, had us run. Yeah. Jeez. That's why I always use livestock. Oh my, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> but, um, While you're on the actual ranch, um, and I've been told from other contestants in later seasons that it improved, um, that they were given a salary of, um, I want to say, I think by like the the two-digit seasons, almost a grand a week. But when when I did the show, my season, we were given $300 a week for while you're on the ranch. And then when you leave the ranch to go home, you're expected to go back to your regular life and your regular job, but also while trying to remain in the competition for this show and putting in the hours and hours of working out. And, you know, the sending videos that they need and all of that stuff. Like I said, from what I heard, um, that that sum went up somewhat in later seasons, mm-hmm. maybe like $1,000. But our season, it was still only $300 a week. What was happening that made your family want do an intervention with you? And what, was that while you were still on the show? That was after I'd gotten off the ranch, but I was still considered on the show. So I left the ranch in August and my finale wasn't until December. And oh, okay. um, yeah, at the time I, um, I started dating, I did what like everybody tells you not to do when you've got a major life issue going on. Don't get into a relationship. I literally met a guy the weekend I flew home from that ranch. <laughs> <laughs> so he was my boyfriend at the time. He's actually now my husband. Uh-huh. So he happened to be still living in Alaska and I, because my shtick for the show was I'm from Alaska. I was part of, you know, it's part of the 50 States. I actually had packed up all my stuff and I was moving to the East coast because I'd been accepted to the university of Maine law school on a full ride scholarship. And Mm -hmm. I was like, this is, yeah, this is where my life's going. This is what I'm doing. And then I met him. (laughs) Right. And so, um, I had to fly back. The show flew me back like every couple of months. Because they wanted to film me and get footage oh, in, Alaska. in Alaska, right? Keep up, yeah, right. Keep up the facade. Exactly. So, um, on one trip in October, I flew back to Alaska, and he hadn't seen me for almost a month, and he'd known that I was on the show. I had to explain it to him because it premiered in September, and I'd met him in August, and I was like, "By the way, this is about to happen, so mm-hmm. be prepared for it." Right. And he and he made me laugh because I guess he watched about ten minutes of the first episode, and he called me, and he's like, "I won't be watching this." Huh. He's like, "Nope, this is not a thing I'm going to watch. This, yeah. Don't expect me to watch any of this." You're like, oh, you might be a keeper. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> he was like, "You're crying on this. They're horrible to you. This is disgusting." Mm-hmm. And. And, and I think, like, even at the time, I was a little offended. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, well, how dare you? You know, right, but in right. retrospect, obviously, he was clearly right. So in October, I got off the plane after he hadn't seen me for a month. And at this point, my hair was falling out in clumps. And I had um, black circles under my eyes. And my body was, like, covered in bruises. Mm. And um, to get maybe overly graphic or whatever, my, my uh, menstruation had completely stopped. And I was, I was in bad shape. I was yeah. obviously starving and overtraining. And so, so when you're, I, I imagine when you're at the ranch, they're controlling every bite that goes into your mouth. They're exercising you like crazy. I've heard you say previously, they teach you to use diuretics to like. I learned how to dehydrate. It right. was like the world's worst wrestling camp where I never actually wrestled right. anybody. <laughs> right. I, so um, what does that look like when you when you are now home? Do they just expect you to continue those behaviors or is there some sort of community still pushing you and driving you when you're home? It looks, um, it, it's hard to believe, but it looks worse when you get home. Um, they make claims. Um, I know there's a disclaimer on the show that, that we're monitored by doctors and and I always like to tell people that honestly, I could have come home and started to do meth. And mm. nobody ever would have known, mm. like I could have won that way. Or 
or NBC wouldn't have minded if I'd gone home and cut off a leg, except the audience might have noticed it. Like, right. that's how much they did not pay attention. I also was required to, like, check in with what I weighed, like, weekly. Mm. and With, um, like, a production assistant or something? Yeah. Or a nutritionist? It always production. No, it was okay. always a production assistant. Okay. I like to make clear to people, I don't, I can't speak for other seasons, obviously, but I like to make clear when I talk to people that we were very deliberately on my season isolated from both the doctor and the registered dietitian assigned to the show. We had very, Mm -hmm. very little interaction with them. And there was also a very concerted effort on production's part to make sure that your trainer was your end all be all. And, Mm -hmm. and, And so there was literally a trip at one point where we all went to the grocery store and the registered dietitian was trying to, you know, point out, I want to say healthy choices, but they're not. But this is also 10 years ago. And so, you know, right. like, I can't believe it's not butter was like a food group on that show. And today people <laughs> and be like, why would you put that in your body? But at the time, right. you know, at the time, Fabio said it was really good for you. <laughs> right, exactly. And he had great hair. <laughs> so come on now. Yeah. So, but anytime she would try to make a suggestion, um, somebody from production, a production assistant or a producer would intervene and go, do not eat anything that she has recommended or said until you speak to your trainer first. Mm, interesting. Was there, was there ever any questionnaire when you were being screened to get on the show of whether or not you had a disordered eating past? Um, so, no. I am aware of other former contestants that absolutely did have disordered eating past and mm-hmm. and revealed mm-hmm. this information to production and it didn't matter. They want trauma. Like right, they right. Why else would you starve people, deprive them of sex, and then put them on camera for 24-7? You yeah. want trauma. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Oh so there was okay, so then that. you're the the intervention. Yes. So I got off the plane looking uh, adorable an adorable hairless purple giant walking bruise right and um because I thought I was cute and clever like I had a ball cap on and um I was wearing long sleeves and since he does not have the IQ of a rock um he, he looked at me and was like nope nope nobody nope nope and so uh, a few days later he rounded up two of my friends, uh, my, my best friend at the time, actually, who was also the fitness competitor. So maybe not the best person to go to. Right. However, whatever. He rounded her up, um, her husband, and got my parents on on the phone, both on speakerphone, sat me down, and they were like, hey, uh, you might win this competition, but you're going to die. Mm. And we would prefer you didn't die. That would be great. Yeah. And. So from that point on in October all the way to December, I actually stayed in Alaska. I, um, uh, I stayed at either my best friend's house or my boyfriend's house, and those people babysat me, literally mm. babysat mm. me. They cut my workouts from between six and eight hours a day down to three hours a day, which is still ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I was like, why do you hate me? You won't let me work out. Right. And, and then they would um, – they would watch me eat. They would, they would make sure I was eating. And there were a couple of times, like I cried through meals Mm because I didn't want to eat them. And my boyfriend, my husband, now I remember one meal in particular, he was like, you know, I'm sorry you're crying, but you're going to eat every bite of that horrible half cup of oatmeal you've got in front of you. Like, it's not like he was asking me to eat a steak dipped in gravy and ice cream and sprinkles it was literally a half a cup of oatmeal you know right and, yeah and so and I was still freaking out about that um they also um he made sure I went and saw a therapist and saw a doctor not associated with the show um you know it's kind of best not to go to the people who are making money off you to ask them to worry about your health <laughs> right. um I do have to say I have to give the doctor on my season credit because he did contact me at one point just to check in um, and I'm not sure why. I don't know if he did that in other seasons, but I know he collected data on our season to write a book and uh, publish an article. Uh-huh. And when I explained to him, hey, things are really bad, um, he said, yeah, so these people don't care about you. They care about making mm. money, and um, you need to remember that. So he actually gave me some pretty solid advice that nobody else was willing to give me. when I When I approached a producer at one point, um, telling them, hey, this is really bad. Things are really awful. Things are not okay. 
I got told to save it for the camera. Oh, jeez. Yeah, which is hilarious because, like, I did, but it's weird. That never made it to air. Huh. Well, oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Right? Yeah. right? yeah. I mean, it made it to air that I was crying and having a breakdown. But they. But made it was it, it was like... over your hangover. Exactly. It was <laughs> right. over by not being able to keep up on the treadmill if you watch the show because I was just partying too much. Right. That's why. Wow. It... Yeah. So. Why do you think... Americans loved that show so much? I think that it's a couple of things. Um, I know that I sound like every time I talk about this show, I'm like, it's hot garbage. And don't get me wrong. It is terrible. It's garbage. Um, But that said, people love an underdog story. Mm -hmm. And I think that fat people are automatically assigned the role of the underdog. At least they were back a decade ago, a little bit. As time has progressed, it's gotten less underdog and more um, hateful. Um, and, and don't get like fat phobia has been around forever. Like I'm standing on the shoulder of of giants that started the the fat activist movement. When I start talking about any of this, like anything body positivity now was started way the hell before me with the radical women in the '70s who were willing to come forward. And basically say, you know, go fuck yourselves. We're fat and we're here. And you're going to have to deal with it. Right. But I think that it's gotten a lot worse, honestly, with, I don't want to say like social media, like I blame social media for everything. But, you know, with Instagram, quote unquote, fitness celebrities, the mentality that, you know, being fat is synonymous with being gluttonous and lazy and disgusting. I think it's become even more ingrained in, in society's mentality. And I think that that show did part of that. It, mm-hmm. it, I mean, like, I don't just think that. There are literally scholarly articles that show that people watched that that program and afterwards had even more negative feelings toward fat people than they did before watching it. It also seems to me like it's this, you know, chemical combination of the voyeurism that Americans really like, like that kind of celebrity paparazzi culture. And then it's also this transformation myth that, you know, Cinderella, like you, you know, you suddenly turn, turn into someone else and every, all your dreams come true, combined also with the whole American dream, you know, that yes, like anything can happen in America. Like, look, look at this. Absolutely tied to that. There's this myth um, that surrounds it. And it's one of the things that I've said in a lot of the interviews that I've done since then that like. People think that if you go from fat to thin, because there is so much thin privilege in society, that suddenly, ta-da, your life is amazing. Right. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about some of the the studies that were done on The Biggest Loser that sure. came out with some interesting results. It sounds like you did some of your own research, which I actually did not know about. Oh, yeah. I've, I'm fourth author on the first one that was just published. And then the second piece of research that I just collaborated on with Dr. Moore, who was formerly out of Mercer University and now out of Alliance, is in review for publication right now. Yeah. And we and actually, is, the, is the first one the, NA, the NIH study? No, no, I, I don't have it, it. That one is a qualitative, uh, excuse me, that one is a quantitative study. And uh-huh. I wasn't associated with the NIH study at all. That was season six, I believe, that they worked with. And also that one focused on medical factors. And my, um, my focus is social justice and social work and psychology. So the research that I've done um, focused on the psychological repercussions of going through the process of losing weight in a public forum like weight loss mm. reality TV. Yeah. And so what, what did you find? Um, we found that, well, we found, first of all, that you you needed psychological services and help through the entire process, and there weren't any, and it was kind of garbage. Um, and the paper is basically interviews that we did with, and I'm super grateful for this, because a lot of people believe and think that I'm like this black sheep of the Biggest Loser contestant family. But in private and behind the scenes, there are quite a lot of really supportive, amazing contestants. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure so, so many of them are scared to speak out too. Like every time they threatened to sue me, like I said, I was like, bring it on. But there are other people that were involved in the show that literally like own their own businesses. Right. You know, had college funds for their kids and had family to worry about. And so coming forward and if NBC had decided to actually proceed on suing for that non-disclosure agreement, it could have damaged their lives irreparably. So I don't, I don't hold any blame. No, I do, however, I have no love lost for the contestants that have come forward and given interviews where I know they're blatantly fucking lying when they counter what I say. Mm. 
I have no love for them at yeah. all. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I know that some things have changed on different seasons, but I also know that like that scale on TV, just to give a little example, it's fake. It's been fucking fake from the beginning. It's still fake. And when you go on national TV and you won't acknowledge that shit, when you're directly asked that question, I have no respect for your integrity or your character. Mm. So do, yeah. you, do you already know how much you lost before the, you got on the fake scale? Um, yeah, I already knew what okay. I weighed. Uh, yeah. not, not every week, uh, no, but at the finale, I absolutely did. I knew at the doctor's office. Right. Uh, every week, though, no, you don't know. They put you on a cattle scale, and they film it, and they don't show you what it is, and then you have to get up on that fake scale, and they make you do it three times, which, again, I don't understand why I don't have a sad card, <laughs> because you have to, like, get on there, and each of the times be like, I'm Whoa. so surprised. Wow, yeah. Yeah, when you just we saw it twice already so what was the basis of what the research found from that NIH study so what the NIH study found was that there was a um, basically to put it in layman's terms there was permanent damage to contestants metabolisms which is Mm. what I from that type of dieting yes from from the process and um, that they went through now I mean let's be fair like if any type of dieting there's an abysmal rate. Like there's no other product in the world that you're going to buy where they tell you 95% of the time this doesn't work. Right. But people still buy diets. I know. I know. Why? It's like, I, I, yeah. 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 So, but along with, you know, 95% of the time it isn't going to work. It also showed that this particular method did permanent damage in the sense that that your resting metabolic rate never goes back to what it should be for what your weight is later on. Hmm. It's it slowed down. It's slowed down considerably. And I believe like producers' responses to that data was like, well, they just need to work out more. Right. Like what, four hours a day? Who who does yeah, that? exactly. Yeah. Do you feel like you have any permanent damage from being on the show? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like what? Um, uh, psychologically, um, uh, I'm, I'm still, as my husband affectionately puts it, I'm, I'm a weirdo about food. Mm-hmm. I'm still a weirdo. I've worked on it extremely hard since having my son, because I really don't want him to grow up with any of the stigmas around food that I have. Oh, yeah, um, I, rem- I remember hearing you talk about you had a really big relapse when you were pregnant. I had a huge, huge relapse when I was pregnant and it was awful. And it makes me feel like the shittiest human being when I relay the story, but I feel like it's important for people to hear it. Um, my pregnancy with my son was very, very difficult. Um, I bled every month. We were afraid we were going to lose him at least twice. And he was a very much planned and very much wanted child. And I ended up being put on bed rest. And um, because I was still not in a, a recovered space and you know, and I know people that are recovered. I believe that recovered is a thing and you can get there. But I think personally for myself, I still would call myself in recovery. Mm-hmm. And I have to give myself that grace. I, I do. I have to give myself that grace that relapse is a part of recovery. Mm-hmm. And so while I was pregnant with him, I was put on bed rest and I was so scared and I was so freaked out that I was gaining weight, which I obviously I should be gaining weight. My body was literally like, you know, making eyeballs and feet. So things should be happening. Like Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a human body. And, um, and I couldn't grasp that. All I could grasp was I was getting heavy again. And so after my husband left for work one day, I decided to get out of bed and go for a run. Mm. Yeah. Being on bed rest when I bled Mm. and yeah. So um, you can imagine. It didn't go uh, well, I imagine. Exactly. You can imagine how poorly that went and how I called my husband hysterical from the house and how he, and it's funny, he, he tells his people, he literally, he drove 140 all the way home with this oh, flasher wow. on to get to me. And he got me and he got me to the hospital. And luckily my son was okay. And he sat me down and he was like, I love you. I love you dearly. But um, you have a fucking problem and you almost killed our kid today. Yeah. And, and he was right. And so I was like, so I'll be doubling up on that therapy yeah. for the rest of yeah. the Yes. And you know, are there other moments in your story that you feel like were those moments of like, man, I, I got to get some more help on this. Like I'm still deeply suffering. Yeah. Oh yeah. Even recently I, um, so I've got um, rheumatoid arthritis and mm-hmm. I also have fibromyalgia and I was just diagnosed recently. That has been 
a complete mind fuck again for me regarding weight because trying to get a diagnosis for two, almost three years, um, was infuriating and frustrating because every time I went to see a doctor, I kept getting told my problem was that I was fat Mm. and I'm like, you're not fucking listening to me. And I don't give a shit if you think that I'm fat, but I promise you I've weighed a lot more than I weigh right now. And I wasn't having these problems. So the problem is not that I'm fucking fat. And I heard a brilliant thing. And I believe, I, I hope I'm crediting it to the right person. I think it's Reagan Chastain. And I heard this really recently where the approach she suggests is to say to a doctor now, okay, great. I understand you want to talk about my weight and that you think that's a factor, but tell me how you treat this in a thin person and let's fucking do that. Mm -hmm. I will forever from now on be using that. Yeah. I imagine that you still must feel like people are watching you. Mm -hmm. So yes. So or um, watch it. Not even, let me, let me rephrase that. Watching your weight. Exactly. That's exact. That's a, a, watching my body and what my body does. Yeah. Um, so along with everything that happened with the doctor and everything, and I chose to do uh, a lot of different medical things that were suggested to me by doctors to try and get things to help and try to get things to work. And now I'm currently on um, immunosuppressant injections mm-hmm. for the RA mm-hmm. and a, a myriad of other drugs. But before I reached that point, like I said, I kept getting diagnosed fat. I finally found a rheumatologist that this is a terrible thing to say, but at least she sort of listens. So I, I, I stick with her because it's better than being dismissed by all the rest of them. One of the things that she suggested that I try, and I only agreed to try it as long as my labs showed that there were results and that it did anything, is that I go vegetarian. And I panicked. Mm. Like I, because that to me was like, you are asking me to exclude food groups. You are asking me to be disordered eating again. And I'm not sure I can fucking do that because um, this is going to make me a basket case again. And so thank God I've got an amazing therapist where we live here now too. And I checked in and, and I did manage to do it. But however, one of the major side effects with all of the meds and all of the pills that I'm on, I am not what a doctor would refer to who uses the bullshit measurement of a BMI as emaciated. But as far as I'm concerned, when I could see my fucking ribs, Mm-hmm. I'm emaciated. Mm-hmm. It's been it's been really really uncomfortable for me um because even at my finale I have never looked or been like this and and it's all a side effect of all the sickness that I'm going through and I find myself reacting really shitty first of all when I get compliments from people mm. like, casually in my dentist's office that are like you look amazing and I stand there and I'm like Except I feel like I'm fucking dying every day. Right. You know? Yeah. This I guess is that- so. This oh. is such a common thing in our culture. It's so disturbing. Oh. So you're you're thinner than yeah. you've probably been in a very long time, but you've you're sicker than you've ever been. Yes. Right. Weirdly enough, and it's so funny. I I don't even remember who I was having this. Con- oh, I was having this conversation with another former contestant from actually the Australian version of the show, and um, she being incredibly perceptive and in definitely empathetic person had contacted me and she's like, are you okay? Mm. Cause she see from my, my social media postings. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not fucking okay. I, I'm not, there's, I, there's something up with the meds where I, I need to get them readjusted. And as far as like inflammation is concerned, going vegetarian didn't do shit for my meds. So, mm. I mean, at least hooray burgers again. But at the same time, like it would have been nice if it helped. It's really, very frustrating to not even be 40 yet and feel like you're 88. I mean, like it's really, Mm. it's really emotionally difficult and a struggle when you go to Disney World with your family and your 60 year old parents can chase your son and you've got the motorized scooter because you Mm. can't. Wow. It's, It's a struggle. Do you feel like you still struggle with your relationship to food as well? I think that I struggle with both my relationship with food and my relationship to my body. Um, You were asking me about people if they still watch my weight and what that's like. And I can tell you, like, there's been many experiences, especially after the show. And when I still live in Alaska, because it's a small community, that strangers would come up to me and do things like look at my grocery basket when I was shopping Mm. at the grocery store or, oh, yeah, one of the best was when I was out to eat having dinner with my husband and somebody came up to the table to look to see what I ordered and asked me if I should have been eating that. I thought my husband, who happens to be a very large 6'3 man, was going to come across that wow. table. That yeah. stranger. Yeah. So I um I still struggle with it. And I had a really weird experience. 
And I'm sort of uncomfortable telling the story, but I'm going to tell it anyway, just because I want people to understand how ingrained it is to be uncomfortable with our bodies. I know there are lots of issues and that one of the rising demographics of eating disorders is in, in the male community, but I'm going to speak as a woman and my mm-hmm. experience as a woman. I, I love the BETA convention. It's one of my, my favorite educational experiences. So many experience. people have said that. Uh-huh. Oh, it's, it's just, it's an amazing community. I learned so much. There are so many brilliant, just brilliant people there doing groundbreaking work, especially this year the keynote presentation talking about the uh, the intersections of marginalization and how it affects eating disorders it's, it's just an amazing place to be well when i went and i gave a featured speaking presentation in 2015 my body looked very very different than it does right now and i was i was very very anxious and very very concerned about how i looked going this time. And if I would feel like it was still my community, thank God it was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. It still Mm -hmm. felt like my community, but I still have, and I say this as like a prideful thing. Like this, this statement comes across always a lot of times when people are like, I've lost weight, but I still feel like a fat girl. Boo hoo. That whole fucking sad fat girl trope. Mm -hmm. Um, I, to the average person who viewed me on the street right now, they probably would not use the descriptor fat for me at current mm-hmm. point in time, but I'm still a fat girl and I know what that means. And my power comes from that. I was galvanized by that. I was galvanized by being a fat girl. And I mean, actually, I'm thinking about it on the other side where like so many of the fat positive community has judgment about weight loss and then there you are standing up there smaller I could see where that self-consciousness would come in yes it did and and luckily it didn't manifest it was an entirely my own anxiety built thing altogether I did think that I was gonna have to walk around explaining to people that I was incredibly sick like all the time like I'm really ill I'm really ill yeah and I never had to that wasn't that wasn't anything that was forced on me and Mm. and like I was saying like my identity is as a fat woman this is my identity and I say that you know it's galvanized in me because it takes strength to grow up as a fat woman in this society. And I was a, a solid fat girl from the time I was in elementary school. And I was a fat fucking cheerleader in high school. This is who I am. And, you know, I've been, I've had arrows and, and rocks thrown at me, you know, metaphorically. And it's galvanized me. Like, bring your best internet trolls. I can handle, mm-hmm. I can I can handle any of your bullshit. I can handle your misogynistic shit. I can handle your fat phobic shit because I, I, I'm a fat woman and I've been fucking galvanized through that. Mm. I've been through fire and I'm ready. And regardless of what my body looks like, I fucking identify that way. And it's a, it's a source of strength for me. Hmm. And, and I worry sometimes with, with the manifestation of like fat positive and body positive communities online that we don't let people define themselves for themselves or understand what they're feeling. And there's this division that happens in those communities. Mm -hmm. And and back to your question about people like, you know, still judging me or, or, you know, keeping track of my weight. One of the things that I've really learned that's, that's become pretty profound with me is as we're talking about intersections, there's intersections of everything and and in marginalization. And I've found that when people want to discredit what I have to say about my experiences or about the research that I'm aware of and what's going on, if they look at me and they see my body and they perceive me as fat, they try to dismiss me and discredit me as just being fat and bitter and unable to lose the weight and lazy and sloth light. Mm-hmm. But if they look at me and they perceive my body as thin, they decide that I'm ungrateful and I should have appreciated the experience of the biggest loser more because the ends justify the means and that I'm just a snotty privileged bitch that doesn't know what she's talking about. They project these views. Yeah, upon- I wonder, do people credit your um, smaller body now to your your biggest loser experience? Um, I, you know, I haven't really heard from... Um, like fans don't comment on uh, fans. It sounds a ridiculous thing to say, but I have a fan page on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So people that only interact with me via social media because they heard of me based on the show, haven't really contact, like talk Mm -hmm. to me about like what Mm -hmm. my body's looking like and how it's changing. Um, And then the people in my life that really know me that have commented on it, don't associate it with the show at all. Yeah. Because obviously you speak out against it all the time. 
Exactly. <laughs> so they know. I came to the conclusion about myself and when I finally learned to love myself and it took 30 long damn years to get there that um, I like being strong. Mm -hmm. I like taking up fucking space. I like that about me. I you know, like I say, even as a kid, I was built like a, a, a brick shit house. I didn't appreciate that as a kid because it wasn't a thing that, that was appreciated. But I fucking loved that about me. A complication of my illness now is like, not only do I look physically frail, I am physically frail. Like I, I mm -hmm. lift like I did, mm -hmm. I can't. And I feel, um, I feel a sense of vulnerability that I had lost. Um, and I felt the same sense of vulnerability when I was in a much bigger body and every fucking random human being on the planet felt like they had the need to tell me what I needed to do when I was eating something or when I was working out. Mm -hmm. And I, and I finally had felt like I was in a place where I was like, I don't feel fucking vulnerable. I feel fucking powerful right here. My right. this is great. You know, fuck your BMI, fuck your bullshit standards for me. My labs are amazing and I'm not killing myself so that I'm bleeding through my shoes at the gym and I'm not doing things like drinking a cup of coffee and calling it a fucking meal. This is great. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and so now I'm, I'm, I'm struggling again to get that back to that place of acceptance with my body. And it's going to take a while because it's going to take a while to get me on the right meds and to yeah. stay again. Right. Yeah. And I'm a horribly impatient person. So that's how <laughs> Well, it's, it's hard to be patient when you don't feel good, too. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did the show stop because of the more, like, I know that one um, season, there was the girl that, I, I don't know her name, who was... Rachel clearly, Fredrickson. There we go. Yes. Um, who was over too thin, I suppose. Would be. Um, if you're going by the BMI. BMI. She, yes. If you go by the BMI, she was in an unhealthy, which BMI unhealthy is bullshit. BMI, right. Right. Out there, but she was in we an know unhealthy, that. <laughs> yeah. She was in an unhealthy um, BMI category. So a show that was touting itself as being for health and for right. the health of the people on it now just had a giant, this is bullshit winner. Right. It was a little difficult think, for them. Do you think that that was part of its demise to going off air? Um, I, I like to think, and, and maybe I'm patting myself on the back a little too hard, but I like to think that part of its demise, that it was a combination of things. That it was the NIH study being released. Uh -huh. It was yeah. her finale and her coming out and people's reactions to that. And then um, finally in 2015, four other former contestants finally came forward in the press and went, hey, this lady, Kai, by the way, she wasn't fucking lying. Mm. Think that like all of those things, an amalgamation of them finally made it so that it wasn't profitable for NBC to do the show anymore. Because let's be fucking honest, if it was still profitable, it would still be going on. Sure. Because sure. that's what that's what mattered. Our, our health wasn't what mattered. The profits mattered. Right. But, you know, the creator of the original show, um, one of the original producers, J.D. Roth, who I believe wasn't even associated with it as it went further on, I, I feel like there's a special place in hell for him seated next to Sarah Huckabee Sanders. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, just to throw that in there today. No worries. <laughs> um, uh, he apparently created his own show very recently this past right. year. I'm hoping it bombed in ratings. I have no idea. I obviously didn't watch it, but he managed to, unfortunately, in my opinion, I find it pretty sad, convince some former contestants to participate in it. And it's on some random network I've never heard of. Right. So. It's like the, they had regained the weight and he's trying to get him to go back again or something stupid. Uh, something. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Just a couple more questions I had for you. Sure. I, I've heard you talk about how you feel like you owe it to the people that watch the show and thought this was real to kind of like you, you feel indebted in this kind of social justice service. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and it's funny because I've had this argument with other former contestants that, that counter me, uh, both <laughs> via social media and via the press. My basic, like a, a really simple summation of it is, you know, a lot of these contestants walk around patting themselves on the back for quote unquote changing and saving people's lives for participating in this. And if they've taken a moment to actually speak to people when they go to speaking engagements and if people open up to them like they have to me, then they, if they want to accept the responsibility and accolades of this quote unquote life changing amazing thing they did. They also bear the responsibility just like I do 
of the young girls and the women and some of the young men that I've spoken to that resorted to things like vomiting up their meals or starving themselves in an effort to emulate what they saw was the weight loss numbers Mm -hmm. on that TV show. I believe that you bear that responsibility because you participated in in it. And, you know, when I get into those conversations with other former contestants, my my basic statement on that is we all do what we can sleep with at night. And I couldn't sleep at night after having those conversations and knowing what people were doing and then looking at the empirical data of what this show was doing to viewers and not say something. Mm Mm-hmm. What does the empirical data show that happens to viewers after they watch um, it? When they, uh, and I, I might be misquoting me, but anybody could do a Google Scholar sh- um, search on this. I believe that the first author on this is U-Y-O-O um, on some mm-hmm. of the studies on it. But they found that not only does it raise negative bias about fat bodies and fat people, by just by watching it, it also damages the self-esteem of anybody watching it, even people who are considered, you know, quote unquote, okay, according to the, again, bullshit BMI measurement standard, mm-hmm. watch the show and feel negatively about themselves after watching it. Hmm. It's a damaging it's like, show. It's like Facebook. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. basically. Like, yeah, it makes you feel like shit, but you right. know. Yeah, and I, interesting. You know, I um, I participated in it. And when you participate in something that does harm, you have an obligation to do everything you can to fucking right that harm. Like that's, Mm -hmm. it's just a basic, it's a basic principle I was raised with. And, you know, I try, we're all fucking hypocrites. Everybody's a hypocrite sometime, but I do my damnedest to walk my talk. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Where does your rebellious, fiery nature come from? I think my fieriness and my rebelliousness comes from the fact that I was a fat kid. And I'm fucking galvanized by that. You know, I was, I was burned by it. I was burned by the bullshit people tried to throw at me. And, you know, I had a moment and, and I've had a lot of these awakening moments. And like the, all of us, you know, you, you have an aha moment and sometimes you get twisted and you forget your bullshit and then it comes back to you again later. And one of those big moments for me was as a teenager. I went to elementary school and junior high in New Jersey. And the attractive aesthetic for females at that point in time was very, very thin and, um, you know, very high hair. <laughs> so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh, while I could do the high hair, I could not do the very, very thin. That's just not my body type. And so I was mercilessly, mercilessly bullied, you know, while I lived in New Jersey. And then at the age of 14, we moved because we're a military family and we moved to the state of North Carolina, where the metric for what people considered was attractive was completely different mm. than the New Jersey. And suddenly I found myself being told that I was, you know, beautiful and I was this and I was that. And what that really did for me is I realized that at 14 years old, that if someone is standing in front of me, that if they're telling me that I'm beautiful or if I'm ugly, it absolutely has nothing whatsoever to do with what the fuck I really am and everything to do with their fucking perception of the world. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I, think, I think that's one of those things that I, I learned early on. And like I said, you know, I forgot it sometimes along the way. I got sucked into diet culture like everybody. But it's one of those things that I go back to a lot that maybe other people hadn't had the opportunity to have that realization, that experience. Because not a damn thing changed about my body. Not a damn thing changed about me. I changed my geographical location. Right. And some people were responding to me differently. Interesting. And yeah, I wonder, I, too, if being a military child where you were used to constantly having to make new groups of friends that you knew, I just, I wonder if you're in, if you're not used to that, you may really take what people say, like, these are my only friends, these are my only community, this is all I got. But you were more used to it. Is that play, play into it, you think? I think that I had to have a stronger sense of who I was because I couldn't rely on, on people, around, um, you. Yeah. people yeah. around me to echo that back to me. Yeah, Absolutely. there there it is. There it yes. is. <laughs> Absolutely. I had to make a stronger sense and have a stronger connection to what my values are and who I am or because I did not have the same people to echo right. back to me or to, to give me a role to play. Right. or try to define me by a role. I had to define myself. And, and that's one of the things that I, I really, I really love about myself. I get yeah. to fucking define who I am. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. 
Well, is there anything else you want to talk about or add? I feel like we've covered a lot. I'm hoping to release just a happy little kind of beach read Kindle book that's a, a fictional reimagination of weight loss reality TV. I'm sincerely, fingers crossed, hoping it comes out next year. Be on the lookout for that. Well, thanks again for meeting with me. I, I really do appreciate it, Kai. Oh, thank you for having me. As always, thank you for listening today. I hope you'll be in touch with your thoughts on the show or even for future shows. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and our website, everybodypodcast.com. Please tell me your stories because this podcast is for everybody.